Yes. Uh, sure, you can turn on the side lights if you want. Uh, everything up there is correct for giving. Uh, our giving basket is back there, and this week I promise to remember to take it into the office, Sherry. Thank you. <laughs> How many of you know it's not smart to leave the offering from a church in the hill you're just sitting there in on? Yeah. Anyway. yeah. God protects us, though, right? Uh, Tuesday night Bible study still going on. Thank you for the flexibility. I, I didn't make it last week because my cousin, my best friend from uh, Seattle was in town and we just had a great day playing 27 holes of golf at Circling Raven and just, just a wonderful time. And it was actually pretty cool because on the 18th hole, it's about 465 yards. My cousin, who is an amazing golfer, hit it about 135 yards to within 10 feet of the hole. I, from 150 yards, hit it to 10 feet from the hole. We wound up being two inches away from each other. Yeah, it was really, really cool. He made his next putt, and it took me three putts to make it in, but that's, that's not important right now. Uh, Friday night Bible studies. If you're not attending Friday night Bible study, I can just tell you, you are absolutely missing out, as are the people in your world who need you to pray for them, right? Well, that was... That you're not youth group, you're missing out too. And you're really missing out on youth group. We're just having a great time. We haven't had boundaries class in months. Thank you, Sherry. For, that's Sherry showing everybody everything I do wrong. Yes, this hasn't been updated. <laughs> well, you no longer have a wife, so somebody's got to help out. <laughs> <laughs> See, Sherry, I'm... I, If you don't like organized religion, meet your disorganized pastor. Thank you very much, folks. I'll be here all week. And that's why I have Sherry. Right. Somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to do it. Um, today on the Living Hope Promise, if you belong to our church, you're going to learn how to answer tough questions, pray in miracles, hear the voice of God, and love the person in front of you. Today's message is going to talk about the first one, answering tough questions. And although this isn't a tough question today, it is one that's incredibly important. Because we're going to talk about grace and stuff. There are some passages in the Bible that are so well known that I don't get around to preaching them very often. And this is one of them. And this came to the surface last week when I was kind of praying through some things. And we're going to go through it. But first, the analogy of the day. The microwave and new plates. Now, probably about... Uh, I guess about 11 years ago now, I was, I was probably in about my sixth month as pastor, and the finances of the church were such that I still worked at Quinn, and I still waited tables, and I had a really good month at Quinn, and I had a really good weekend at the restaurant. And I said to Lynn, I said, Lynn, I know you've been talking about getting new plates for the entire time that we've been married, because we had, we had been using the plates that we had gotten for our wedding for about 11, 12 years, and, and, and all the men here know what it's like when your lovely wives are through with something, and they're ready to move on. Thankfully, she wasn't through with me at that point, but, right? So I said, you know what, why don't you go out and get those plates you've been looking at, and in our world at that point, nice new plates meant Fred Meyer. So not really expensive, but better than what we had. She's thrilled. She goes and she gets some, some earthenware plates that she just loved. And she got them all washed and got them all cleaned. And the next day I decided to have the inaugural use of these plates. And I made myself a plate of nachos. I stuck it in. I pushed the one minute button. It digged. And I, and I looked at it. And the cheese wasn't even melted at all. And I thought, our microwave's broke. So I put in another 45 seconds, I shut the thing, it goes, it dings. I reached to pull it out, which was my first mistake, because this plate is now thermonuclear. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> Cheese, hardly melted. So I boldly declare, Lynn, the microwave's broke. And I showed her the situation, and she gave me that... Oh, you stupid, stupid man look, which a few of us... Oh, Vicky's laughing too hard. She's... And Keith, Keith goes, I know that look. <laughs> and she says, Sean, the microwave isn't broke. The plates conduct heat better. 
To which I just said, no, the microwave's broke. And that's how God works in our life. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, amen. We're going to get back to this in a second, so hold on to that thought. This is out of Ephesians chapter 2. It's a very well-known passage. And like I said, it's so well-known, I probably haven't teach, taught on it the whole time I've been pastor here. But we're going to look at it step by step. So this is out of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, for all of you keeping score at home. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. Everybody say according to. According to. According to the prince of the power of the air. Everybody say according to. According to. Of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Now let's unpack this for a second. Paul says we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Now let me modify this a little bit. The Hebrew, for, the Hebrew concept for dead is separated. So whereas we see something as being dead as having no life within it, the Hebrew concept is separated. Right now, Alex lives in Pullman. If I was talking about this in Hebrew, I would literally be saying, yeah, Alex is, well, dead to me because he's dead from me. Okay, does that make sense? So it doesn't mean completely inanimate. The reason I say this is there are parts of Christianity that take this verse that say dead in your trespasses and sins. To mean no life in you whatsoever, like this music stand. Completely inanimate, and until God brings you back to life, you can't make any decisions for him at all. That's not the case. Dead means separated. And where else do we see that? Well, we see that in Adam and Eve. What did God say to Adam and Eve if they ate from the tree? They would die. Did they physically die? No. Not yet. They started dying. Right? But what happened? They were separated from God. Does that make sense? Okay. And then he goes on to describe how people were, before they became Christians, formally walked according to the course of this world. Now, the phrase according to. Does anybody, know, anybody remember where else Paul talks about according to? Romans 8. Romans 8, exactly. He says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ who walk according to the Spirit and do not walk according to the flesh. Now, this phrase according to is very similar to our English phrase tracing. Okay, If I was to put my shoulder against the wall and walk all the way around the room holding my shoulder against the wall, I have walked according to the sanctuary. Okay? So when Paul says you walked according to the course of this world, he's describing people before they got saved. But I really want you to notice this next phrase. According to the prince of the power of the air. Well, who breathes the air? All of us. Okay. This is one of those times when Paul calls Satan the prince of this earth. Satan for a short period of time, basically the length of time of this planet, is the prince of this world. Jesus calls him God of this world four times. In 1 John, he says we're all under the control of Satan until we get saved. We're going to see that in a second. I can confidently say God did not give my grandmother cancer because God doesn't have cancer to give. It's not in his toolbox. Okay? You, we pin the blame squarely on the fact that we live in a horrifically cursed planet, and Satan is, for a short time, in control. We just celebrated Juneteenth when all the slaves were set free. And this is the analogy I love to go back to. When Abraham signed the Abraham Lincoln sign, call him Abraham Lincoln, he's my friend. When Abe uh, had Abe and Mary over for dinner the other night. When Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, all the slaves were legally freed, but it took two years of the northern armies fighting every battle at every farm to free every slave. You, we, we're getting that analogy, correct? Yes. Okay. Of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And wouldn't we all say our planet right now is severely under the influence of the prince of the power of the earth. 
Verse 3, among them we too all formerly lived, and then he described it, in the lust of our flesh, in desire, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Now again, I want to clarify something. Do you see here that phrase, by nature children of wrath? Okay. Part of what, one of the central thoughts of Christianity is called original sin, which means the same sin that Adam and Eve committed was passed down to every human being who was born. Now let's clarify something. Some people who don't agree with Christianity like to say that Christians teach that babies are born evil. No. They're born fallen. Like all of us. We all have a propensity towards greed and selfishness. Even if every child wasn't born evil, no parent has ever had to teach their two-year-old how to say no. No child has ever had to be taught to use the word mine after they learned it once. Right? Even if it wasn't ingrained in us, we all committed the same problem. Christianity doesn't teach that children are evil. It teaches that every human being is fallen, which means we have a propensity to be greedy. Okay? Is that helpful? Yes. Okay. But God. Everybody say, but God. God. Anybody glad that their story has a but God in it? Yeah. I was on my way to jail, but God. Yeah. I was in jail, but God. I was caught in my addictions, but God. Isn't the, aren't those the six best letters in the entire Bible? Been there. Been there. Got the t-shirt. Uh-huh. More than once. More than once. <laughs> you, you went through the advanced studies, and then the remedial studies for a second time, right? Well, yeah, the case study did it the first time. I had to try it again. My dad said, try it till you like it. There you go. <laughs> I never liked it. All right. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trans... Do we just stop this real quick and just share something? Go ahead. Please. I will. Thank you, Pete. For Woo! Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going somewhere. Do you know that only Christianity teaches of a personal God? Amen. A God that sees you, knows you, cares for you, has any feelings of affection towards you. Islam, Allah, doesn't care about humans and only talked to Muhammad. Hinduism, the force of the universe, is cold and uncaring. Karma does not care about people, folks. Okay? Same with Buddhism. Buddha is sitting distant. Buddhism doesn't even have to have a God. If you have anybody who believes, well, I think God is, and one of the things they say is loving or caring, friends, that's only Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, only our half of Christianity, the Arminian Wesleyan part of Christianity, teaches that God has nothing to do with evil. Okay? That's a side note. Because of his great love, which she loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, at our absolute worst, running as far away from God as fast as we possibly can, choosing every other possible God or goddess in existence, doing everything we could to destroy those we loved and ourselves, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And he's going to clarify that in a second. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, that's a little bit lengthy, a little bit confusing. Why is it important that he raised us up and sat us with him? Because we are no longer according to the power of the air. We live under a different jurisdiction. Now, we're still on the same planet, but we don't have to live according to the same rules. Is that good news to anybody here but me? Yes. And when did all this happen? When we were, oh, come on, do it for me, dead 
in our transgressions. When you were as far away from God as you could possibly be is when he loved you most. Amen. Amen. And seated us with him in heavenly places. So that in the ages to come, everybody say ages to come. He might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. God wants to show the entire planet, even people who disagree with us, even people who hate what we believe, he calls us to reach them, right? What does he want to show? The surpassing riches of his grace and kindness. For it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It doesn't say. It's the scintillating post on Facebook that leads people to repentance. Okay? But here's the part I want you to see. What does Paul fully embrace? The whole world is under the power of Satan. We get raised up to be in Christ. But look at how he even puts this. That in the, come on, ages to come, he is articulating. It's a fight. It's going to be a struggle. Is everybody seeing that I'm not making this up this week? Thank you. <laughs> I have Zachary here at half service. I really don't need them though. Oh, uh, by the way, half service will do again next Sunday. Half service is at 8.30. It's just the sermon. The Sunday after that is 4th of July weekend. We're not going to do half service that weekend. Capiche? Capiche. All right. But here's the word you see kicked around. Surpassing riches of his grace. So let's talk about grace for a second. Grace is... God's empowerment for us to live like Jesus. Okay? Now, I'm going I'm to clarify this in a moment as to what it's not. Grace starts with forgiveness, but then moves us towards empowerment. Now, in English, we use grace to mean mercy and or forgiveness. Rent is due on the first. You get it in on the second. And your landlord isn't angry because there is a grace period. Now, technically, that's mercy. Right? This is the deadline. We're giving you a little time. Technically, it's mercy. Um, you're talking to the friend. You're going, that person really messed me over, but I'm going to give him grace, and we're going to try again. You've heard that before. Well, that's technically forgiveness. Are we tracking with this? This is really important. Grace is a big concept. Within grace, absolutely, is mercy and forgiveness. But it's so much more. It's so much more. If you've ever battled an addiction of any type, when you first decide, I need to change, and you come back to God, and you receive his mercy, and you receive his grace, that is absolutely grace, right? Right? The moment you stop drinking, the moment you stop using, the moment your life actually changes, that's also grace. Does that count if you had more than one? It counts every time oh, okay. you come back to that decision. Every time. <laughs> but I, I really, thank you, Pete. Thank you. That's an excellent question. And it actually plays into the point. Okay. Would a few of you here say with me, I've made some great decisions and then I went back to okay decisions and then I went back to bad decisions and then I went to good decisions. Anybody here say, yeah, I've needed a few more rounds of this? Amen. Okay. Amen. Now watch this. Because it's like the microwave. Huh? Exactly. Thank you. It's going, what did I walk into? Ready? <laughs> When I put the microwave in the plate with the nachos, what did I want? Cheese to melt. Can we all agree cheese, shredded cheese in a microwave melting is not a big ask? Unless you're from China. Okay, that's probably true. 
Or Lynn used to buy that non-fat cheese that never melted under any circumstance. Anyway. I wanted cheese to melt, but instead the plate got thermonuclear hot. Was there heat in the microwave? Yes. Oh, yeah. But the problem is the heat in the microwave went to the plate, not what I wanted. Now, you're probably wondering, oh, you better get there quick. Why didn't you put the cheese on the plate? How often have we said to God, God, I want the cheese to melt. And he goes, yeah, but there's so much sin in your life. I got to heat the plate first. God working in our life. If you have places in your life that are in rebellion or places in your life that are in disagreement, God has to work on that first before he can go on to work on, Lord, heal my friend. Lord, answer this prayer. Lord, give me peace. If you're praying for peace, or joy, and you have places of rebellion in your life, what does God have to do? He has to heat the plate before he can melt the cheese. Well, that's does that make sense? We want to see God move in power, right? Yes. This side, right? Yes. But we have to agree with him first. Or we're not trustworthy. And there's enough non-trustworthy Christians running around there, aren't there? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Is this making sense? Yes. We want the grace to go one direction. And he goes, oh, I have grace for you. But we got to fix a few attitudes first. Yes. We got to fix where you run to for comfort first. We got we to gotta fix the propensity to use credit cards when you're feeling depressed. Except for Guitar Center, that's perfectly normal. Oh, Hello? Mm -hmm. All right. Did I answer that okay? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, everybody look at your neighbor and say, this is the actual verse we came for. So this is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. A very well-known verse. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, the reason we quote the part that says, for by grace you have been saved, is because that's easy to understand. Amen? Amen. We can sing songs about it, we can sing amazing grace, we can crochet it on a pillow. But let's be honest for a second. The rest of this thought is a little bit confusing, right? For it's by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. In English, you don't use double and triple negatives. In Greek, it's considered smart. So we have to unpack this a little bit to see where, where, what he means. But we get the first part. For grace, you've been saved through faith. Do we at least get this part? Yes. All right. So now this is how I deal with verses that seem to be a little awkward. I say, okay, what is grace talking about? And I look at the second half of the verse. For grace, you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. In other words, grace doesn't come from ourselves. Anybody here have somebody in their life who messes you up? And then comes to you and thanks you for forgiveness, even though you haven't forgiven them yet. <laughs> they were just, they're just ready for you to forgive. And you're like, uh, we might have to have a conversation first, right? You don't give yourself forgiveness. Okay. For grace, you've been saved and that not of yourself. It is a gift from God. Okay? You seeing how those two things come together? God, I mean, think about this. If you've been hurt, can somebody else set the terms for you forgiving someone else? If somebody smashes in my car and Andrea comes up to him and goes, oh, don't worry, Sean forgives you. 
Andrea and I are going to have a conversation, and then I'm going to have a conversation with whoever smashed my car. Right? God sets the terms. But look at what the terms are. You've been saved through faith. And then he clarifies. And the grace is not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Now, that needs to be the best news you hear all week. Amen? Amen. It is by a gift of God. Now, let's look at what else he says that makes it confusing. He then describes faith, and he says, you've been saved through faith, not as a result of works. Now, how do we know this? Paul grew up a Pharisee, obsessed with, I can be saved by my works in the law. Right? If I just do all the right things, God is going to consider me righteous. God is going to be happy with me. We'll make it really simple. But what Paul's saying is your ability to do all the right things means you can walk around boasting. I did all the right things, and so God is happy with me. So what is he coming out to say? No, you got saved through grace. How did you get the grace? Faith. Faith in what Jesus did. Jesus took the test. Jesus got 100. We said, Jesus, sign my name to the test. And he signs your name to the test. And then when God looks at you, he sees how well Jesus did, not how poorly you did. Amen. I think I need a better amen than that. Amen. Okay. D does that make sense? Do you see how I broke down those phrases so that you would get it? Because if you read this wrong, you're going to say that grace is the gift of, I'm sorry, faith is the gift of God. Well, everybody has faith. Atheists have faith. Buddhists have faith. Muslims have faith. That's not the issue. The issue is, is your faith in the right place? Is your faith in Jesus? Because once your faith is in Jesus, then you get the grace. Then you can say, even though I've went, made every bad decision you can make, I know that if I die today, I open my eyes and I'm in the presence of Jesus. Is that helpful? Yes. So here's, if I was to create the Sean Lumsden authorized version, here's how I would translate this verse. So here's what it normally says at the top. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. And that's a little confusing. Here's what I would say. For you were saved by God's free gift of grace and not anything you did. Yes. Salvation was received through faith, and not works of the law, so no one... Is that helpful? Yes. And remember, every time Paul talks about works, he's thinking about works of the law. Old Testament. Okay? And this is important because there are whole sections of the Christian church today that do not believe Christians need to have any kind of good works to follow their life. They say, you're saved, and anything you do to try to improve it is just you're not believing that you're saved, and that's absolutely not true. How do we know this? The very next verse. Would you all agree you've heard this verse before, if you've been in church for a while? Okay, you ready for the very next verse? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Now, let's, let's clarify a couple things. Paul, in saying it's not as a result of works, knows he's going to tick off a lot of people. Because he's writing to people who are saying, yeah, you can believe in Jesus, but you still have to follow the law. He knows by saying that he's going to tick off a lot of people. So now he's going to clarify and how's he going to do it? He's going to use the same word. For we are his workmanship. We are his work of art. Yes. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Now please note something. Just like Paul says in Romans chapter 8, God's foreknowledge extends in the future. But it's not about getting saved. It's about doing the kind of things that Jesus would do. Yes. Amen. 
We are predestined, not just for salvation, but to be conformed into the image of the Son. That's right. Is this helpful? So let's go back to eight minutes of freedom. Look at your neighbor and say, it's time to talk about freedom. 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 Just to remind you, eight minutes of freedom, something you do every day. You are talking to your subconscious. You're talking to the part of you that's still a little bit rebellious. You do this eight minutes to 15 minutes a day, and you do this for 21 days, three times. So a total of 63 days, because the first 21 days... Uproots the old thought and plants in the new thought. Second 21 days shrivels up the old thoughts and strengthens the new thought. And the third 21 days makes your new thoughts your voice. And then the old thoughts an echo. How many of you want self-destructive thoughts to be quieter in your head? Well, this is the process we go through. Okay. And then when you go through this meditation, there's three elements. One is about your past. And this is where you reframe shame. First of all, you discern that there are pockets of shame. Look, folks, the enemy will not let you forget times in your past when you have felt crushed. Right. It's not going to happen. Okay? But you can put a new frame around the mental image so that when you look at those difficult times, you notice the beautiful frame of God saving you, Amen. God protecting you, God sustaining you. It may still have sucked. But God made sure you got to this place today to hear how to get free. And then you declare, so this is part of your thinking, that you have traded all of your shame for courage. Second element is about your presence. It's called inner vows. What are the old lies you're still believing that gets you into bad patterns? Like the record that skips. Right? And then you declare new realities about what your future is going to look like. And the third element is for your future. You discern future growth. If God has his way, what will I look like in a year? And then you declare your future fruitfulness. This is how I look based on current fruitfulness. And I'll show you about that in a second. So how do we do this based on this verse? Where you reframe your shame by saying something like, there is no shame in my past because God loved me and saved me when I was at my worst. So every time the enemy tries to tap you on the shoulder and say, remember when, remember when, you go back to you and say, oh no, there is no shame in my past. Another thing you can say, those events shaped me, they didn't define me, and now they are proof of God's unconditional love. Amen. Yeah, I might have lost money. Yeah, I might have lost a job. Yeah, I might have lost a marriage. Yeah, I might have gotten hooked on something. Those events shaped me. They didn't define me, because I'm still here, and I can still make good choices. Is that good news? Yes. Second one, new truth to old lies. You learn to say, because I was saved through a free gift, I don't have to perform to be loved or protected. Now, everybody look over here. Most inner vows, those lies that you've believed your whole life, have to do with the thought that you have to perform perfectly to be loved. Every child should be loved, period. Amen. Most of us grew up in a home where you had to act perfectly to be loved. Most people, in fact all people, usually responded to that at one of two ways. One way is you become a perfectionist, and you do everything perfectly, and you're terrified I might do something wrong, and then I won't be loved. Or you go to the opposite end of the spectrum, and you say, turn pick a like finger. Huh? And you turn out like Jeff. You turn out <laughs> Jeff and Pete, and you say, pick a finger. If you're not going to love me the way I am, I'm going to go destroy myself and everybody around me to force you to love me. Okay? If you take this verse seriously, I was saved through a free gift. I don't have to perform to be loved and protected. Amen. Most important thing you can ever take away is this thought. My security and significance is from Jesus alone. Amen. My security and my significance, my safety and my importance are from Jesus and Jesus alone. 
constant, your whole life. I can now choose to invest in people from a place of being loved, not earning love. If you get this, your marriage improves, your parenting improves, every relationship in your life radically improves. When you come to the point where you can say, look, I am loved. That's never going to change. So I can risk loving you. One of the worst songs ever written by the Gaithers has the best message. I am loved. I am loved. I can risk loving you. For the one who knows me best loves me most. Remember that one, Ron? Do you? Uh-huh. I am loved, I am loved, I can risk loving you. Just as boring as humanly possible. But you notice I didn't forget the lyrics? The one who knows me best loves me most. All right, and then the third one, when you talk about your future, I will be as fruitful investing in others as I am in. And then you pick something you are already good at. It is God's will. It is absolutely Jesus' will for you to grow in your impact, good impact, on other people. Okay? It is absolutely his will. I, I've been talking about my step-grandma today. She is the most amazing woman. Everybody around her, their life is enhanced by her. And as I reflect, that's how I want to be. Well, guess what? That's how Jesus wants me to be. And then when you pray for it, you grab a hold of something you're already good at. Good at. And you say, I will be as good at being fruitful and investing as others as I am playing the piano. Because for me, that's not going to take a lot of faith. That's what he wants. That's who I'm going to be. Is this helpful? Are you getting the breakdown on this? All right, so here's the last thing. Here's the last thing, real quick. Uh, I'm going to start bringing in something I call Sunday to Starbucks. How do you take today's message and share it with somebody who doesn't know the Lord? And here's what you would say based on today's passage. Jesus loved me at my worst, but he didn't leave me in my worst. Is that good news? Amen. He loved you the way they are, you are, but he said, because I love you, I'm not going to leave you here. I'm allow I allowed him to lead me out of my worst. It has to be part of your will. And now I'm not afraid of others at their worst. Yeah. Now, does our country need to hear this? Yes. We are so terrified of everybody who doesn't think like us and agree with us. Folks, if your life is in the hands of Jesus, it doesn't matter who doesn't like you. That's right. Does yeah. not matter. It would be nice, but it's not necessary. If your, hand, if your life is in the hands of Jesus and you've got financial problems, well, guess what? He put money in your pocket before. He'll put money in your pocket again. If you're having relational problems, he blessed me with people in the past. He'll bless me with people in the future. And I don't ever have to be afraid of what other people think of me. Do you know that you can only... Feel shame for people whose opinion you respect? You know, that's right. Part of our country right now is so terrified of what everybody thinks. Now, here's the problem. We're terrified of what everybody thinks, so we want to make them feel bad too. No. You have to come to the conclusion. There are some people who I don't want to like me. Amen. I don't want to be like them. I don't want my sons to be like them. And if they don't like me, I say, thank you. Amen. It's called considering the source. Right. Doesn't mean I don't love them. Doesn't mean I don't try to reach them. Amen. I just do not give them my joy. And I don't give them my peace. And if they don't like me, I say, thank you. Promise? Well, I'm never coming to your church again. Promise? Promise? <laughs> and finally, now I'm not afraid of others at their worst. I just love them like Jesus until they love well, Jesus. Yeah. Amen. That's precious. That's right. Amen. Telling you what, if, if healthy people of integrity stop pouring the flames on the fires that unhealthy people of 
who don't have integrity are burning? They burn out. If you come at me like this, and I do this, all of a sudden now we're in fight. If you come at me like this, and I go, you start to look stupid after a while with your fist up. Now, one out of a thousand will still beat you up. That's the problem. We have to protect ourselves from the one out of a thousand and then the 20 people that they recruit. Right. Seriously, it, it, it may only be one out of a thousand, though, that you really have to be afraid of. And then what does Jesus tell us to do? Turn the other cheek. If they persecute you in one city, stand and fight. If they persecute you in one city, go to the next. I'm meddling now. Lord! Just bless us, as you always do, and we know that it is your desire for us to be changed into your image and love the world like Jesus, and everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you guys. Uh, Tuesday night, Friday night, see you soon.